All right, hi. Uh, I am David with the Comic Book Investments, and I'm here with Maurice. And the reason why I have Maurice on, he reached out to me, and he is a comic creator. He has made his own comic book, and I love giving the opportunity to other comic artists, writers, anything out there to help boost their, you know, their 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 comic that they're selling, right? So, Maurice, you've done film comics probably a bunch of other stuff that i'm not aware about why don't you introduce yourself a little bit well thanks so much for having me david i love your show watch every video and uh, learned a lot from you got uh, so many good tips thank you thank you and well i'm morris devro i've done a few independent uh, feature films mostly in the fantasy horror genre the most known one is uh, a film called end of the line and another one called slashers that's playing right now actually on Netflix UK and Italy, not in the States or Canada for rights reasons, but it's, uh, and the reason it's playing now, I did this movie years ago, is because it's sort of like the Squid Games in, in where it's a game of death game show where uh, contestants can win money and, you know, they, if they survive and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, cool. like, it, it's not, it's Squid a, games. pardon me? You're before Squid Games then. Oh my God, I did this years ago. But actually there were other movies that tackled that subject before mine. So I can't take you know uh, credit for that. The only difference with mine, my movie Slashers is that mine is the contestants are completely voluntary. It's, a, it's like a, a, in a world where this show is legal, meaning it's playing on TV and it's all legal. If, if you sign away, it's like, let's say a boxer, if he dies and it has happened, boxers have died in the ring well you can't sue the other boxer and the family can't sue you know it's something that happens so this is in a world where okay if you sign away your rights and you go into the show if you're killed too bad you you know the risks you're taking so in that sense my movie slashers is much bleaker than squid games because squid games is actually it's still like underground and hidden and it's like rich people doing it you know uh, uh, getting these poor people, uh, whatever, but it's it's still not something that's accepted and watched by millions of people on TV as something okay to do, to watch people risk their lives and die on live TV. And that was my take, because before my movie, there was like Arnold Schwarzenegger's The Running Man, which was based like on a Stephen King story. But again, that was prisoners that were forced into this to... Yeah get their sentence reduced or to be free. So uh, again, mine is pretty much the only one where it's 100% voluntary. And that makes it different because uh, people have different reasons why they want to go on the show. It's not just all, like in Squid Games, they're all going because they're, they're poor. They need money, all of yeah. them. That's the only reason. In my film, each one has a sort of different reason of why they're going because that's it they're, as there would be because you know because the survivors not only do they get money but they actually become famous and then could go on to careers and other things so there's other motivations that if it was something that was accepted in society blah 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 then anyway so that's well, i things. heard i heard that in russia they tried to create a reality show where they would drop like six or eight people in this wilderness and they literally had to battle each other. And, and they asked them like, well, are they going to battle to the death? And they're like, some people will probably die. And then it got canceled because of that. That's what they said. And then all the human rights came out. I'm like, yeah. not going to lie. That would be pretty interesting to watch. Like a long well, show of them finding yeah. each other. Hunting. Well, my, my film took place in Japan. Uh, not to say that Japan would be the first to do something like that. It would, you know, many people would point more to a more like, let's say fascist country that might go and accept something like that. But the reasoning for why it was, for my film that it was set in Japan was that um, they always seem to go to 11 in many things in, in their arts and movies and this and that. So it just made it to, uh, for the film to be very colorful and very uh, crazy. So anyway, yeah. Did but yeah, I'm not surprised if Russia would be my, or would be one of the first to legalize death did matches. They, um, did you film it in Japan? 
No, no, no. That would have been prohibitively expensive. Okay. Uh, no, it, it was you know low budget film, a very low budget film, uh, and it was shot in in Montreal, uh, where I live. And so, are you the director of these? The writer? What do you do? Uh, I am you? all of the above. I, I I write. I direct. I produce. Unfortunately, <laughs> which means a lot of my money goes. To, yeah. And I edited it. So uh, basically. Most of the creative, uh, you know, it, um, it, if I, I get to take a lot of the credit and a lot of the blame, depending if you like it or not. And all the risk. Yes, and all the risk, unfortunately. So I saw one of your trailers. I can't, I can't remember which one it is. That's the first one you mentioned where there's like a train or something. Yes, yes. That's end of the line, yeah. So was the guy who was in that, was he also in uh, Dragon Ball? The movie? I don't know. I'd have to check. I, 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 I've lost contact. Movie. Many of them are have played in many other movies. Uh, the one of the leads of End of the Line actually uh, played in the last Independence Day. Uh, and was his so, name Justin something? Uh, no, no. But uh, no. So many of the actors you've seen elsewhere. One of the actors was in one of the X Men movies, and. You know, they they they're not they're not superstars, but they they are in <laughs> different things. I could have swore I saw that guy, and I'm like, it's possible. It like I said, Dragon Ball, the movie Dragon Ball. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> it's part of a movie. They made a movie. It was not a very good movie, but they still made it. Cool. Um, well, that's cool. Um, so I'm assuming you have. Do you have like a background in this, or is this was kind of like? You really had a passion for it, so you went out and just made it happen. If you're talking for movies, well, when I was a kid, of course, my my first love was superheroes and comic books. And, you know, by the time I was maybe 15, I had about 15,000 comics. Mm -hmm. uh, and, like, Daredevil number one and lots of, you know, all the X-Men and just like a huge collection. And actually, I'm in Montreal, Quebec, which is um, uh, we have French translated comic books as well as the English versions. So I had a lot of French Marvel comics and um, I would like sell my French ones and then buy older English ones because I'm bilingual so uh, the french ones were in black and white in the interior so they were the uh, you know they were well, the same but in black and white in the interior anyway it, it's just uh, uh, now the, some of them are actually pretty pricey all the keys uh, the french editions are actually pretty expensive as well uh, you know it's like a hulk 181 the french canadian version still will sell for a few thousand dollars if it's in high grade and et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, that's a, so yeah, so I loved comic books as a kid. And I actually, it was my first job in a way I was buying and selling when, when I was an early, you know, when I was 11, I was actually, you know, selling comic books. I had my own price guide for the French comic books because none existed. So I had seen the Overstreet so I just sort of did my own overstreet for the French ones and just like put prices and created my own price guide. And when I'd have clients come to where I, uh, in my, my bedroom, I just whipped out my guide and said, how much is that one? And I'd go in the guide, oh, guide says this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so, uh, and they sold, you know, and, and uh Maybe they, my prices were really good compared to where they'd usually shop. I don't know, but I was just happy. I was, you know, uh, getting to buy lots of comics in English that I was collecting. Anyway, so I had a love for comics and I had a love for movies. Uh, of course, you know, big Star Wars fan, uh, still Clearly. wearing a shirt, and you know, just generally, uh, movies and comic books were everything. But I went. You know, as I grew older as a teenager, movies became more and more something that, oh, yeah, I, I want to direct, I want to write, because I couldn't draw. If I could draw, I might have, you know, because I, I, if I could draw, I probably would have went into wanting to do comics. But since I couldn't draw for, you know, stick figures or even... <laughs> I'd, I wish I could draw, but I can't. Yeah, yeah. So... 
so that sort of led me to uh, going in studying film and wanting to make movies. And I started to make my own movies. But of course, what happens is that, well, unless you, you're you know successful early and are hired to do this or that, it costs a lot of money to, to make movies. So I actually ended up selling all my comic books to help fund my first feature. Like so Kevin, stayed... East, uh, Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith. Yes. Yes, I, I did the Kevin Smith thing before Kevin Smith, of course, because I'm I'm an old man, and uh, uh, so yeah, so I, I sold all my comics. Uh, unfortunately, it was before eBay, before you know everything. Yeah. So it was at a huge loss because yeah. when you're you know unloading, uh, you're you're getting pennies on you know et cetera et cetera. But you know you can't look back. You have to just. The future, Before. but I was actually a good speculator. If, if, because I was buying, you know, when I was a kid, I bought like 20 copies of Moon Knight number one and like 20 copies of X Men number 129 and 130. I, I was like, like, I, you know, I had good taste. I had like 20 copies of Wolverine number one. I was there. It's just I didn't hold <laughs> on yeah, to them. It but right. it, it's just the ones I speculated on ended up being you know home runs years later so I, I didn't buy 20 copies of random crapola you know so it's yeah. like so if i look back i go I, I do go oh damn if i had kept them i'm not like oh damn i wish i had kept those 50 copies of dazzler number 20. <laughs> it's oh, like God. no yeah. i'd be crying over that but yeah uh, anyway so long story short i started to make movies and worked in the movie industry in different capacities as an editor of um, I did movie trailers for big movies and uh, commercials and stuff like that at the same time doing my own feature films but as I, we were talking about before in the pre-show movie making when you're producing and putting your own money into it is very expensive extremely expensive and the distribution side is an unfortunately full of pitfalls where it's very hard to get your money back. Not because there's not money to be made, but the way things are set up between you and the customer, there's all these sharks that have ways of making that you never see any money. Mm -hmm. uh, it, regardless of the deals you sign and having it checked by lawyers, that, that serves no purpose. Just to prove this point for anyone it was unclear about this concept. Peter Jackson, you know, the famous director of Lord of the Rings, blah, 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 had, had to sue New Line for his profit participation in Lord of the Rings 1, 2, 3, because in the bookkeeping, they, they call it the Hollywood booking. Lost money, I'm sure. It's like all the Lord of the Rings movie never made a penny with, yeah. with Hollywood accounting. So, uh, you know, they managed to fandangle all the numbers all the time. And this is rampant for big movies and small movies. So the only reason they settled with Peter Jackson is they wanted him to do The Hobbit. So yeah. they settled and they gave him money. But for many other people, they never get a dime of profit participation, yeah. blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, it, this is just to say that it's um, um, anything creative is what drives people like you and me to our mediums. But the business side of those mediums is unfortunately many times uh, filled with uh, pratfalls and sharks and uh, that take advantage of people who are doing it out of love and passion and who are not coming at it necessarily just from a purely business side. So yeah. they, of course, get smacked around and, you know, I, I, I went to Los Angeles a few times to the American film market where films are bought and sold from around the world for, at the time it was for like, you know, uh, be it for DVD and TV and this and that. And you would not, um, I met so many filmmakers who had done their own movies like I did and, you know, put all their money into it, all of them, all of them got ripped off, never made a dime. Movies that you could find hundreds of copies everywhere and every blockbuster they never got a dime and it's just such a rampant um thing that anyway when i made my last movie it, it was like even if it was well received and 
it was just so hard to get my my due getting money back to me mm -hmm. so when uh, so uh, after that the creative urge is still there but the movies i was trying to get off the ground without putting my own money into them things weren't weren't uh, panning out but the urge was still there to tell stories yeah. so i went back to my first love which was comic books and i decided to take one of my scripts that i had written earlier and transform it into a graphic novel because there have been precedents of movies like uh, 30 Days of Night. Yeah. That he had shopped it around as a screenplay to make as a movie. No one wanted it. Then it got made as a graphic novel and boom, it got optioned and then made into a movie like in the span of two years, et cetera. So th there are cases like that. So, uh, you know, so in a way I was like, okay, I, I'll, you know, I'll go back to that first love and, transform my 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 script into which at the time was a, a script about Sonny Bean who's the leader of a cannibal clan in Scotland uh in the 16th century it's like that's a, the, the, your book behind you the clan of the devil yes right? yes so uh the um I don't know yeah I don't know if we can see anyway we will uh people will be able to these are variant covers of course but anyway um the yeah so it's a legend that inspired uh other movies like the hills have eyes of wes craven that was set in colorado in like in the mountains in colorado in modern times but it was based on the sawney bean legend of this cannibal clan that lived in a cave and attacked passers-by at night brought them back to their killed them brought them back to their caves and ate them and the clan became bigger and through incest like Kids and this is a true story. Here's the thing. Uh, it, it, in, in Scotland, there are people who believe it is true. Most people think it's just a legend. But when I dug out my script, I started to do more research. And now that I had access to the internet, uh, because when I wrote it initially, it was before uh, really uh, there was not much available. And I actually found, because I did a lot of research, I've been working on this for many years. and there is a surprising amount of real stuff that I found that it's like, I can't say it confirms a hundred percent the existence of this clan, but it's pretty close. I mean, once people read my whole story and actually after the last volume of my story, I will also be showing all the research and where I found tidbits of information, even in That's like cool. the archives of universities in Scotland and like documents that have survived from trial records in the 16th century. I actually have like scans of the trial records from, you know, 1591 and it's all in old English. So it's very hard to read, but mm -hmm. you know, you get the hang of it after a while and it's, it's, a, it's linked to the witch hunts of that time, which are absolutely real things where innocent people were burnt at the stake and et cetera, et cetera. And it, this ties in to the Sawney Bean legend because what happens is that imagine you're wrongly accused of being a witch and there's no way to get out of it. Mm -hmm. You are going to die. If you manage to escape the law, well, if you're on the run, you can't live in society because if you're caught, you're you're going to the stake. So it was, it, you know, because the original Sonny Bean story had no motivation whatsoever for why this couple started to live in a cave and do what they did. Mm -hmm. And while I was doing all this research, it was like, oh my God, there were people, and this is documented, that escaped prison and this is documented in, in like Scottish files who were about to be executed as witches who escaped prison and were on the run. Mm -hmm. And the dates add up to the Sawney Bean legend. And I'm, I'm, I'm reading all these things going, oh, my God, no one has ever. There's never been any film or book that has told this story. Or found your this comic. Picture. You, you, you're a comic. You released the first one, and now you're releasing book two? Yes. So book, book one is 110 pages, and uh, book two is about 120. 
and uh, there's going to be 12 books. Okay, and, so and and how, all, how yeah, long yeah. are you releasing them in between? Like, is it hopefully monthly? one one every three months? Okay, hopefully three four months. months. The, uh, all my 12 books are written and drawn, and there's like 150 pages that are left to be inked. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm almost at the finish line for just having it all be readable for the public. Um, book three is being colored and four to 12 still need to be colored, but the brunt of all the work is, is done. And uh, yeah, so, uh, so book two right now is on Kickstarter. Uh, the campaign ends November 21st. Uh, so yeah, uh, each book will be over a hundred pages. So, pardon me? How much, pardon me? how much are you charging for each book? Uh, they're like twenty four ninety nine plus shipping. Uh, and they can still. find them on your website? Well, uh, number two for now will be just on the Kickstarter, but I am selling number one already on eBay. So okay. uh, anyone can, if they wanted it right away, they can order it on eBay. What about Amazon? And, I, I, and I did do as well, like book one, which is 110 pages, which is the full book one. I did do also a floppy of issue number one, which is just the first chapter, which is like 36 pages that I did as like a sort of collector item where I have variant covers of that issue number one. Because of course, uh, as we know for collectors, they love number ones, you know, we all do, you know, it's like, so the thing with graphic novels is that they're not, you know, they're still, they're not as co collected as a number yeah, one. You know? So I was thinking, okay, I'll do a number one for those. And if ever, you know, my dream one day came through that I'd be doing a Netflix or an HBO series of this, well, that number one will be. <laughs> but like you said, those things are very, very rare. And even then, the value might never go up or whatever, but still did it. So yeah. Yeah. So what what role do you play in the actual comic? Are you the writer? Do you do any, you said you don't draw, so I'm assuming no. you hired an artist to draw? Yes, uh, I ended up having to hire many, many different artists from around the world uh, be, uh, because the project is so big. Uh, it's like I had artists working on different chapters at the same time. So it would be a, ver a variety of styles which might, uh, you know, some people might not like that, but it was the only way because one artist could not do everything be, or else yeah. I'd be doing it for 50 years, you know, because since the, because what I'm paying the artists is, uh, you know, I'm not paying, let's say the top rate of a Marvel, but I am paying a good rate, uh, which is expensive for me, but still for, for these artists, they're probably doing other jobs at the same time where, for mine, they'll put it aside when they have a better paying job and then get back to mine when, yeah. when they have free time. So what happens is that it was taking too long when I only had like a first artist. And actually the first, or <laughs> uh, the first artist I had after a few pages, he left the project for a better paying job or whatever. And just, so I had like six pages that I thought, well, what do I do now? So I restarted with another artist he got up to 10 pages. So I was redoing and repaying for the same pages. But then when I got to 10, he left as well. But his reason, he left. He sent me this long letter where he was saying that since he started to work on the project, weird things were happening. He was in Spain. And he was saying weird things were happening. Friends of his got sick. Uh, things fell. Uh, weird things, noises at night. Blah blah blah, and all the. So, so I guess being very superstitious because it does talk about you know witchcraft and Satan and blah 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 and et cetera et cetera. So that was his reasoning for leaving the project. So then I was going. Okay, so I'm starting a third time with another artist. Started all over in again. My mind, I said, okay, if this artist leaves, I'm just continuing wherever he stopped. Yeah. And so, and then when I was going, uh, you know, it, this, the pace 
he was, you know, it wasn't moving as fast as I wanted. So that's when I started to hire another artist to work on another chapter, then another artist, then another artist, and artists from everywhere, Brazil, Italy, uh, Indonesia, uh, one in the US, one, you know, it's like, so it, it becomes like this international thing due to the internet where you can contact these people. And so, yeah, so, uh, so that's pretty much, it um you know I, I started this full time in 2012 so we're nine years in the the comic yeah yeah when did you release the first one though when uh last one? may last may oh wow yeah. so it took like nearly eight years or so to get the, the the first one up and going and then the second one and yeah well my reasoning behind it was uh, because people ask, well, you, you know, couldn't you have just concentrated on your first one and, and uh, you know, uh, had that one out years ago? The answer is yes, but here's the caveat to that. Since I had made movies, I knew how difficult the after part is when you're actually also having to sell it and promote it and do all these things. So to have to do that while you're still researching and writing and talking with the, because uh, I, I didn't answer your question. So I wrote everything, of course, and I actually give to each artist sort of like a, a storyboard where I, each panel, I like, as if I'm directing, I say, panel one, close up of this character, panel two, wide shot of this. So my directing, uh, you know, it feels very similar to when I'm directing a movie, but instead of being on a set and telling my my cameraman, the op my director of photography, okay, I want a you know a wide shot for this and blah blah blah. Well, I'm telling the artists and doing it on paper and like like a storyboard. Yeah, so and you're basically so directing and writing the comics. Yes, yes, and also of course doing all the research and because all the costumes, all the accessories, all the locations. I couldn't ask the artists to do that because they're already overworked and they have no time to do that research. So, and I learned that uh, from my first versions where the costumes weren't accurate and things like that. So I started to do lots of research and getting frame grabs from museums and paintings and going through books and from libraries so that everything is period accurate. So the costumes now are all period accurate. The locations are all period accurate. The weapons, everything. So I even have at one point a character who, uh, like King James, he has a letter and he puts his seal mm -hmm. like a, with, with wax uh, you know, to, to close it. I found his seal in a museum. There was a picture of it. So I gave that to the artist and he drew it. And so it's the actual That's seal. Cool. So it's like little details that no one, but. All this work is all, for me, in a way, it's fun for the comic, but it's also all done if ever this is translated into a miniseries, meaning all this research is movie ready or TV series ready. So, so yeah. So I want to jump into, because I'm curious myself, and I'm sure there's a lot of other artists that are curious and or writers or you know directors or whatever, people want to make comics. Let's break into the financials <laughs> of it because me as a musician, all I do is lose money. So <laughs> <laughs> I've never made even close to what I put into any of it, yeah. but it's what I love to do. I so understand. let's let's break into some financials. Oh my god! Um, we talked yeah. a little bit before on the pre-show, but uh, so if we. Yeah. Yeah, if we could get, if if your reaction was filmed, you should edit it in because we'll never get that reaction back. Well, here's I the it. Oh but my god! This, this, so, so I'm imagining first you write the script, right? Yes. Right. And you kind of have a layout in your mind, or maybe you write it. So that technically is all free because it's coming from you, right? Exactly. Right. So then our next process would be you'd have to hire artists, right? right. And now. It, this is not a normal comic book. This is, what did you say, 100, over 100 pages per issue, and you're having 12 issues. So way more than a normal comic book. Um, right. I'm trying to think. Let's see. There's there's eight pages b b between till you get to the, the, the middle. So that's 16 times two. That's 32. And it's well, normally like a normal floppy 
uh, like a Marvel floppy is usually like there's like 21 or 22 pages of art and some ad pages. Ad pages. And then you got the cover. And yes. that's a little yes. more expensive, obviously. Yeah, exactly. So, so so my books is like almost the equivalent, each one of five floppies or, or more, almost six. Do you have any ads in your books or is it? Um, well, I mean, I have one ad that I put where – uh, that I had a, a friend of mine who's actually a, another comic dealer who, uh, you know, who encouraged me by buying an ad in it, but it was more to encourage me than because, you know, it's not as if this thing is out everywhere yeah. selling thousands of copies. But anyway, I, I appreciate it. Okay. And so it's pretty um, much all your 110, yeah. 120 pages are all just out of pocket story. Yeah. So I imagine. So you said it's like five regular comic books. Five to six. Yeah. Yeah. Five to six. So what is? Let's break down one comic. What is one of your comics technically cost to do? Because you did all the writing and script yeah. writing. So that technically. It's it's, it's yeah. It's 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 pretty simple. I mean, uh, you know, you asked me if I'd be honest, and I will. It's like I pay a hundred and fifty dollars per page Canadian for the art. Which is about not the color, just the art. So it's like that's like depending on you know US. the rate, depending when it is. So uh, that is is almost the same rate as some of the lower tier uh, companies, like even like Dynamite and uh, some. I don't want to necessarily not, not necessarily right. Dynamite, but companies like that. It's like Marvel. It can go from let's say two hundred to five hundred per page for some of the higher end artists, etc. And the lower end of you know independent comics, it could be like fifty to a, even lower, fifty bucks per page, a hundred bucks per page. So I sort of went, okay, I, I wanted a certain caliber of talent, and for that you have to pay. You know, it's like yeah. uh, a lot of people who are who are starting out, of course, they want to find people. To work for free and say, "Hey, we'll share the profits and this and that and blah blah blah," and you, you can get do going good. Well, you, you good. yeah. The thing with that is that I know that I I could never ask that because I know that there there might never be any profits, you know. So and also, if you want to, for me, the important part was getting this all done. And for that, if you if you're working with people who are doing it for free, they'll like. I had people I was paying who were leaving the project. Could you imagine oh, yeah. someone who would be free? They'd be leaving left and right, and you know, uh, do it delays, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, exactly. You, got, you, you get what you pay for. So if you're not paying someone anything, yeah, you're right. gonna have yeah, yeah. So it's taken me eight years with paying people. Imagine if I was trying to find people to work for free. You know, it's like it would never be finished. I'd be dead and buried before this ever got. <laughs> So does the 150 include coloring or you have to no. pay it? Coloring, I've been paying $50 per page Canadian for the coloring. So average it out. And this, of course, so let's say it's 200 per page. But sometimes for certain pages, I actually spent another 50 per page to another inker because I felt that the, the artists who did the pencil and ink, sometimes uh, the inking... Uh, because since I have many different artists, they have different styles, and sometimes the the inking style some had deeper inks, and uh, because now with lots of artists who work uh, digitally, they the color sometimes adds a lot, so they don't do much heavy inking. But for me, I wanted to sort of uh, standardize the inking so that it sort of look the same so i ended up sort of having to pay some for many pages extra 50 for inking yeah. and sometimes i had to redo of course like i said at the beginning the many pages had to be redone either by cha changing artists or sometimes you know, so but let's rough it out to 200 per page so 200 per page times 110 for issue one you do the math i i can't calculate right now and then you add the printing costs, which for yeah, color are unbelievably expensive. It's unbelievably expensive. So, of course, my first issue is, you know, even if I sold 
uh, you know, like a hundred copies, blah, blah, of course, I'm nowhere near recouping anything. I'm in the red, you know, totally. And the same thing for issue two. But for me, this was, you know, it, it's not as if I'm crushed by this because I, I did know that it would be a difficult road. And for me, I was seeing this as my main goal. One was creative to tell this story because for me, this story needed to be told. It was everything I was learning. My jaw was dropping. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I want to see this on screen. This is, this is incredible. So my main goal was to tell the story, which um, when you're writing a screenplay, you put a lot of work, even if you're, let's say you're not spending, but you're spending a lot of time. But if that screenplay doesn't become a movie, it's very sad because it then just becomes you know something in your way. drawer that yeah. no one because no one reads screenplays even hollywood producers don't read screenplays <laughs> no one reads screenplays movies get made and sometimes screenplays aren't even fucking written sorry uh, <laughs> so you know movies are green lit and there's no script and they're writing it almost daily on the set i'm not even kidding big movies have been done this way but oh, anyway. I, I i've read stories how they're like changing things as they're filming it uh, uh, what would you do this and this? And it's like, yeah. 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 So, so anyway, so for me, there was the creative goal, which was to tell the story, get it all done. Because even if it never becomes a movie or a TV series, having the graphic novel, it's such a close cousin to movies for me to have the visuals and the words. It, it's really, for me, comic books are the closest movie equivalent you could get without actually doing a movie. And so that was goal number one, to just be able to tell the story and have it be out there. Of course, the second goal was once it's all done, then I can shop it around to go, look, all the work's done. Here's the miniseries. It's there. Look at it. Because a lot of people don't have uh, you know, much imagination when they're like looking at a screenplay. They have no idea. But because the visuals are all there, you can look and go, oh yeah, oh yeah, I can see this. I can see this. It's like it's like Game of Thrones, but it's real. It's it's you know it's actual based on historical fact. Holy cow! Yeah, yeah. And there, so that's the end dream goal would be once I have it all printed up to be able to shop it around and get someone interested to do it as a miniseries. So that's but of course that's a one in a you know. But if it doesn't happen, it still exists as a comic. Yeah, that's why I say with my music, I spent, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Not as much as you, but tens it's of thousands of dollars. It's not a competition. It's one competition I wish I lost. Compared yeah. to, I don't want to no. win that one. Yeah, it's uh, tens of thousands of dollars in music. I've gotten maybe hundreds of dollars in returns. And uh, But at the end of the day, I look at it like this. Like, you know, everyone dies broke, right? You, you can't you can't bring your money with you wherever you just decide to go, buried in the ground, right? So at the end of the day, I look at it like I have something. I can listen to my music when I'm 70, 80 years old and go, wow, I did that. The money that I spent, I probably, I'll probably know what it is maybe, but most of it will be forgotten. Like I, don't, I won't care. But at the end of the day, it's like, look, I have this CD or streaming thing now where it's made. So like with you, and your movies and your comic books, it's like, yeah, I mean, maybe spend a lot of money, but at the end of the day, if nothing comes of it, you'll be like, you'll look back at your life and I'm like, hey, I did that. Because so many people out there are talkers and not doers. Right. And and that's like 99% of people out there. It's like, no one will do it. And you made a way to have your dream come a, a reality. Right. And so that is awesome. And that's why I wanted you on here is because you took the risk. Now, I might not work out. I hope it does. I hope this show, you know, whoever watches it will, you know, go to your Kickstarter. You have a Kickstarter. That's right. For your second book. Yep. And that is to I saw you had a goal of two hundred dollars, but it's past that. Yeah, well, I, I mean. You know, I, I put a ridiculously small goal because for me, it's ju I'm just using Kickstarter as the platform to just take orders, you know, basically uh, uh, because, you know, if I put the goal I needed to recoup, I'd, I'd never reach it. You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so there was no point in going, well, I need 20,000, 25,000, whatever, you know, it's yeah. like, forget it, you know, it's like, but uh, so, yeah, so yes, yeah, so I did achieve the Kickstarter goal I set out, which was yeah, 200. There. One, one step <laughs> at a time, one step at a time. Exactly. But uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's great having you on here. Um, everyone That's check right. out your book. Uh, when is it going to be released? And what is the name of it? And where can they find it? Okay, it's called Clan of the Devil, the Sonny Bean Saga. And uh, on Kickstarter right now, you can order book one There'll and two. There'll be a link in the you description have below for the Kickstarter. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so you could order both books uh, if you wanted. If you wanted to order just book one right away, it's available on, on eBay right now. You just search Clan of the Devil, the Sonny Bean Saga. And yeah, um, and hopefully, like I said, for me, each book, for anyone who's investing in the story that they know that the story is done, this is not a problem you because know, what's a danger for a lot of readers is you know, sometimes projects will get abandoned, meaning they yeah. won't get finished, you know, so you won't have the end of the story. And that has happened with even bigger books, you know, uh, where some, they just, oh, uh, it wasn't selling enough and it was just cut off. You know, some yeah. some some TV shows g didn't get their their next season and it ends on a cliffhanger and that's oh. it, you're, you're, you're screwed. Hey, My that. story is done, it's all drawn. In the worst case scenario, I'll be releasing books four to 12 in black and white just to save on the cost of color if, if I can't afford to keep paying to have it colored and printed in color. That's, it, it's so much more expensive to print in color. Mm -hmm. So I might actually have to print later issues in black and white, but you still get the story. So yeah. there's, the story is done. Like I said, all the pages are drawn. There's only a few that need to be inked, and the artist is very reliable. He's been my main guy, Daniel Witchinson. He's great, and he's gonna finish those pages. Once those pages are done, that should take like two, three months. Then everything's drawn and inked. So worst case scenario, I can even release like book four, five, six in a big black and white volume and then seven, eight, nine and 10, 11, 12 in these 300 page volumes and stuff like that. But I want to assure readers that they will get to the end of the story because it exists, it's done. So uh, yeah, and I think that's, you know, for something that is a, a bigger haul, uh, because of course, if it was just a one and done, People go, oh, I'll take a chance. You know, it's it's a complete story, blah, blah, blah. So it's a bit riskier with something that's like ongoing. But in yeah. my case, it's it's done. It's I, I even on the Kickstarter, you can see pages from the later volumes. I put uh, drawings from, you know, book 12, page 99. You know, look, it's, it's there. You know, it's like, I'm not, you know, I'm not joking around. You know, it is all almost all done so yeah so that's pretty much it and, uh, so cool awesome uh great having you on here um i hope i hope people watch your uh watch this episode and go to your kickstarter hope you get a few new fans out of this uh that is my hope like i said as a creator myself if i can give any other creator like a platform to better their you know creative journey then that is my goal so here, here's 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 a promise that I can't, uh, you know, that will maybe never be fulfilled. But I'm a man of my word. If ever I'm in a position where this clan of the devil gets made into a series, I will hire you to, <laughs> to be a musician, to maybe do a song. It's like you'll have to practice up on your old Scottish tunes. But I am part Scottish, so <laughs> holy shit. But anyway, this, so this might be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, who knows? But okay, I'm gonna hold you to that. I'm gonna hold you to that. Oh, and I, I will accept. And anyone who knows me know that oh no, if Morris said that, he will not forget you. <laughs> so, okay. Because I do okay. like your music too. So it's like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, so. All right. Um all right, everyone, go check out the link below and have a good day.